praise you in spirit and in truth, so by following your holy will, we may gain eternal salvation. Amen. We gather today um, on Trinity Sunday, and uh, it kind of flows naturally. We talked about the Father raising the Son on Easter and celebrated that whole Easter season. Then after the Easter season was completed, we talked about God sending the Holy Spirit into the world. And after the Holy Spirit came last week on Pentecost, we now tie it all together, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, with Trinity Sunday. And there is no way that we could ever have gotten to Trinity Sunday without first going through Pentecost, because as I'll talk about in the sermon, uh, the Trinity took some four centuries for the church to figure out. Uh, it's not in the Bible. It's not in the earliest history of the church. It took 400 years for the church to figure out the Trinity, and that's the idea of the Spirit still speaking in and through the church. It's a continuing revelation of God. So without Pentecost, there'd be no way uh, today understand the Trinity. And also today, we, uh, we formally close out, <coughs> excuse me, we formally close out our School of Christian Living classes, and, you know, we've had a rough go with School of Christian Living. Uh, it's been very, very hard to get um, the kids who are enrolled to actually attend, and uh, I want to show, I think Pat is the one who uh, gave, it is Pat, Pat gave this uh, last week uh, to me, and the uh, front page of the Greenfield Recorder is, where have all the Sunday schoolers gone? Uh, so it's not just our problem here at Holy Name. Um, churches everywhere. I went out to breakfast with Father Reardon uh, this past week from the Holy Family Church. We're all hurting. And when you get to a concept like the Trinity of trying to understand God as Father, Son, Holy Spirit, three separate but equal persons, it doesn't make sense. And, and you're not going to just get it intuitively. You have to learn these things. And that's where Christian education is so essential. And so I just wanted to say thank you to our three teachers. I want to say thank you to uh, the families that do count Christian Ed is important. And uh, we do hope that come September, um, maybe we can turn this around. I don't know how, uh, but we are a people of uh, the Holy Spirit and that continuing inspiration. Maybe we'll have some kind of a flash of inspiration to figure out how to do Christian education so that our children uh, will come back and, and learn about God. And lastly, speaking about learning, um, I went to college expecting to be a priest, so I was a philosophy major, and in college for three and a half years, somebody who was almost saint-like because he lived with me for that long was Dr. Scott Sujan. He is now sitting up in the choir lot uh, with my wife. Um, he showed up this morning, stumbled up the stairs coming into church, and I'm looking, I'm looking again, and it was Scott Sujan. Did not have any idea that he was coming, and uh, so I spent three and a half years living with that poor guy. Um, he is now a gastroenterologist down in, in New York and uh, doing very well for himself. One daughter is going to follow in his footsteps and be a doctor. She's out at Tufts. And another one, he said, is uh, not sure, but she's like an operatic singer. And uh, so he's up in the choir. I know he can't sing, so it must be from his wife. Uh, but he's up in the choir anyway, so it's very nice. Uh, I'm not listening over there, Marianne, in your word. <laughs> Yeah, Mary Ellen was very nice to remind me that I can't sing either. <laughs> so, but anyway, it's very nice to see Scott here. The last time he was here, um, I had no children. And uh, uh, let's see, my youngest one is now helping me share in 21, right? And the oldest one is 24. <laughs> so, the oldest one is 24, so it's been 25 years since Scott has been here. And it's, uh, it's really nice to see him. I'm glad to have you with us, Scott. And so, um, as we do gather at this time uh, to uh, bring uh, Sunday School to a close, uh, to celebrate Trinity Sunday, and also to welcome a friend of mine, I ask you to please make a private examination of your conscience. Almighty God. 
have mercy on us, forgive our sins, and bring us to everlasting life. Amen. May the Almighty and merciful Lord grant us pardon, absolution, and the remission of our sins. Amen. May our Lord Jesus Christ absolve you, and with his authority vested in me, I absolve you from all your sins, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Show us your mercy, Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. And let our with you. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Grant, most gracious Father, that with purity of heart, we may worthily fulfill this holy action, establish remembrance of the Last Supper and the death of Jesus Christ, and for our sanctification and salvation. Be present among us, Jesus, our most perfect Master, because you said there were two or three are gathered together in my name, you are among us. We also ask, Lord, that through this holy liturgy, we may experience a spiritual revival and a better understanding of your holy will, bringing us together in one great family, guided by your commandments and by love, truth, and justice. Amen. And may we say together, let us pray in the Holy Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God, invisible, revealed the triune power for all time, now and ever. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to the people on earth. Lord God, heavenly King, Almighty God, God, we worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of God, Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world, and have mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand of the Father, receive our prayer.
the Gospel according to St. John. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. That is probably one of the most famous passages in the entire New Testament. For God so loved the world. It's on pictures. It's on, it's on you know, remember the, uh, the guy with all the funny hair on the sports, uh, every time behind like the, uh, the end zone or in a basketball game, that big furry hair with all the different colors. You hold up John 3.16. That is John 3.16. And it really helps us to understand who the Trinity is. Today's Trinity Sunday, like I said, this is basic, fundamental, essential Christian teaching. Without the Trinity, there is no Christianity. But for as important as the Trinity is to our faith, it is hard to grasp. And it basically lives up here in the mind, not here in the heart. You really don't pray to the Trinity. At least I don't. It's, it's hard to grasp the Trinity. When you're hurting, you don't say, oh, holy Trinity, help me in this way. It just seems a lot more real to pray to Jesus. But the Trinity to the mind is so important that it almost blew up the earliest church. In an over, oversimplified description, the Trinity is the teaching that there is only one God, but that that one God consists of three separate persons, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And since there is only one God, and since the three persons all share in only that one divine nature, that means that the Father is not greater or more God than the Son. It means that the Son is not greater or more God than the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is not greater or more God than Father or Son. They're all equal because they all share in that one divine essence. But they're also separate and unique at the exact same time. So you're saying that God is the same everywhere, and you're saying that the three people are different all the time, and somehow that all has to make sense, and how that makes sense, I have no idea in the world. But we're talking about the nature of God. How in the world are we supposed to understand the very nature of God when we have so much trouble? You can go to a psychologist and have them try and figure out you. They can't even figure out human nature, but we're supposed to try to figure out the nature of God. Trinity is our best attempt but it's still a lot of confusion whenever we talk about Father, Son, Holy Spirit, three separate, but one God. So how this is possible can only be approximated. And sometimes in catechism, what I do is we talk about H2O. You take H2O, you put it in the freezer, you get a solid. You take that H2O out of the freezer, you put it on the counter in a cup, all of a sudden you've got a liquid. You take that H2O from the counter, you pour it in a pot, turn on the stove, all of a sudden you get the steam, you got H2O as a gas. It's always H2O, but it's different. It's the same, and it's different. And so somehow that helps children understand, but there's still so many complications. But what approximation that should never, ever, ever be used to explain the Trinity is to depict God the Father as an old white man with a beard. We actually have churches called Holy Trinity where God the Father is an old white man with a beard. And this is usually combined with a picture of God the Son, as you can probably imagine, as a younger white male with no beard. So God the Father is not older than God the Son. It's not like God the Father came, then God the Son came, then God the Holy Spirit came. That would make God the Son a little bit less than God the Father, make the Holy Spirit less than God the Father and the Son. And we just said that they're all the same. So God the Father doesn't mean as in, you know, like me as to my daughters, that I'm older than them. God the Father is a relationship, not about age. And it's hard to think of those two images without thinking that the Father is a little bit more God than God the Son. So that picture is full of theological problems that we really want to disassociate ourselves from. The other problem is to talk about the Holy Spirit like he's a bird or she's a bird. The dove has a rich and meaningful symbolic presence in the Bible and is definitely used to depict the Holy Spirit. But the Holy Spirit is no more a bird then the Father and the Son are human beings. At the peak of our altar, we have the Holy Spirit up there watching over everything that takes place in the sanctuary. I have no idea why the dove is blue. I don't know if that's the blue bird of happiness color. I have no idea why they decided to color the dove blue. But we have a blue dove sitting up there, but the dove is that Holy Spirit. And that is to give the impression that the Spirit is radically different than the two men. And we have to be careful of that because their Spirit is not radically different than the two men, Father and Son. So we have to be careful to not limit God by our nature. Not to make God into our image in reverse of the Genesis story. But how else are we going to do it? How are we supposed to understand God if we don't understand Him through the experiences that we have? And again, that's why we can only approximate the nature of God. 
The Holy Spirit as a bird seems less exalted than Father and Son, but we also have to remember that Father and Son are not just superhuman beings because God is not just a really powerful and really smart human that makes us into being too much. God is not us. God is completely other, and the only thing we can do is try to approximate that other, and we do so through images of us. But we are not like God, as in God has to be us. So God is other. We're just trying to understand who God is. If all of this were not confusing enough about Father, Son, Holy Spirit, the eternal triune God up in heaven, we've got to bring Jesus of Nazareth, the carpenter, into the story. And Jesus is the whole reason why we have the Trinity in the first place. We believe that Jesus is not only a prophet. We believe that Jesus is more than the Messiah. Christians have come to believe that Jesus is the Son of God incarnate in our world. That means that Jesus brings all that is God into our world as one of us so that God can experience us and we can experience God. The Trinity became a necessary thought to allow God to remain transcendent while at the same time being the very real, very present Jesus of Nazareth. The one who walked the streets of Galilee, the one who got dirt on his feet, the one who felt pain at the cross, that is God. How do you figure that and keep that all in your head, that the transcendent, all-powerful God came into our world and Jesus' feet were dirt, Jesus felt pain on the cross? That is why Christianity is so different than almost any other religion. No other religion does this to our God. But that, again, is about that message we heard from John, that famous phrase, that God so loved the world. That is the essential nature of God, that he loves us more than he even loves himself. The nature of God, as Trinity, we can't figure out, but we know that it has something to do with God so loved the world. You know, if more people were part of our Bible study, hint, 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 this would be a lot easier to explain. But even as we read the Bible, we can witness a progression of how people spoke about Jesus, and the more time they thought about Jesus, the higher their Christology went. Mark is the oldest gospel. Mark actually calls Jesus a carpenter. No way in God's good creation would John, the last gospel, written maybe some 25 years after Mark, would he ever dare to call Jesus a carpenter. And in John, he is now the glorified Son of God. So we watch this progression over time of this idea of who Jesus is, and he becomes more and more and more glorified. But even as the Bible closes, that theological progression, it doesn't close, it continues. And it continues along different paths. Now, once the Roman Empire made Christianity the state religion, Emperor Constantine was shrewd enough to realize that a unified faith helped to maintain a unified empire, and so he ordered, he ordered the bishops of the church all to gather in the city of Nicaea in 325, which is about 300 years after the death of Jesus. Three centuries after Jesus died, the church is again trying to figure out who in the world this man and this God is. So at this first ecumenical council, with the emperor sitting in the presiding chair, the emperor, the bishops agreed that Jesus is the Son of God, was of the same nature as God the Father. But the ones who argued that Jesus was like God, but not really all that fullness of God, like God the Father is a little bit more God, they kept up their arguments and they turned the church around, and so they said that Jesus really wasn't exactly like God the Father, and confusion again returned to the church. And again, more than 50 years later, so now you've got 300 years, now you've got another 50 on top of that, the church had to meet in a council for a second time. And this time, they decided for the last time that Jesus perfectly shares the divine nature. And it's going to take another 50 years. It's going to take another two councils to officially sketch out the nature of Jesus of Nazareth as both fully human and fully divine. And then somehow to incorporate that Holy Spirit into the story as all part of the one God. All together, it took some 420 years before the church finally defined and accepted the doctrine of Trinity. 420 years. Read the Bible. The Trinity is not there. Read the earliest church fathers, the Bible, I mean after the Bible, and the Trinity is not there. 420 years before we could teach what we accept now generally as the Trinity. 
when it takes more than four centuries to do this, we can be sure that the Trinity is not a mere cut biblical concept. The Trinity is a, church, is a teaching of the church through the continuing inspiration, again, of that spirit who watches over the sanctuary, bluebird of happiness or whatever it may be, the spirit is the one who reveals God to us as Trinity. And the Trinity is an example that the church is not a static being, that instead the church changes as it comes to better understand God and God's relationship with us. The Trinity is the church's attempt to explain the eternal God that he has stepped out of heaven and into our world in Jesus. Ralph Waldo Emerson once urged Harvard Divinity students to cast behind you all conformity, to use this, to think out of the box, to think the way your inspiration tells you. And he says, and acquaint all men at first hand with David. That's how you have to experience God. You have to experience it firsthand. It's not only a matter of the mind and understanding the theology. You have to feel God. And that's why our struggle with understanding the Trinity is worth all the confusion. Because it is the theology that allows us to meet God firsthand. Jesus comes into the world to bring Jesus to us firsthand. And in our relationship with Jesus and the Trinity, we meet God firsthand. And the Trinity explains why God so greatly desired this personal encounter between him and us, because God so loved the world that he gave his only son. That's the whole idea of the Trinity. God so loved us. This love defines God. This love is the nature of God. This love is the reason why the church is finally immersed with this theology of the Trinity, because the Trinity lets us meet God firsthand and experience the love of God firsthand. So we actually do so that we may feel the love of God and return that love of God. May that be how we live. May that be the basis of our faith. In these things we pray in Jesus' name, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty well, Lord, as we come together today on the close of our School of Christian Living, we offer our prayers of thanks for our teachers for all the time and the effort that they give. We also offer our prayers of thanks for those families that count Christian education as important in their young people's lives. We also offer our prayers at this time in loving memory of uh, Helen Ferrick, who passed away on June 14, 1997. Uh, that would be the mother of Teresa Belisle. We offer our prayers for the soul of Helen Kislowski on the 22nd anniversary of her passing, June 14th is offered by Joe and Peg Kostchuk. We offer our prayers for Herb Sanderson, who passed away on June 12th of 2012, is offered by Marge Sanderson and family. We also offer prayers uh, for Joseph DeGillis, who is due to have surgery today in Boston, as requested by their friends. We also continue to offer prayers for Liz Bridgman, battling cancer and raising three young girls on her own. Alice, a 16-year-old with lymphoma Hodgkin's disease, and Alicia, a young mother of three with stage four breast cancer, as offered by Cindy Benjamin. We continue to offer our prayers for Frank Sprosky, as offered by his family. I also offer uh, prayers for Bishop Thomas Ganat's health and for the well-being of his wife, Catherine, who is caring for him. Also, we offer prayers for Richard Poe, um, as offered by the Poe and Foster families, and two-year-old Jack Soleil, as offered by Mariana Foster. And before I ask if there are any other prayers from the congregation, i got to ask Cindy. Um, I'm sorry, I can't make out the name on your... Kate Bool. Kate Bool. Kate Bool. H-O-U-L-E. Oh, okay. Kate okay. Bool. Okay. Okay, so we'll also offer our prayers uh, for Kate Bool and pray for her stand, uh, family that they may stay strong. It's offered by Cindy Benjamin and the Ahern family. Are there any other intentions that you would like to offer from the congregation? For all of these prayers, Lord, plus the private ones that we keep in our privacy of our thoughts, we bring before you at this time. We also ask you, Lord, to bless all those who are perish who are unable to be with us here today, and those who are perish who have chosen not to be with us here today. And for these things together, Lord, we pray by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Amen.
Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. Eternal rest grant unto them, O Lord. May they rest in peace. Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
Christ may be accepted to God, the Almighty Father. Amen. Lord God, Trinity in unity, as we offer our gifts of self and substance, we ask you to make them holy. Grant us an understanding of your inner life, for to that living mystery we have been called. We ask this for our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. you will, and it will be done for you. 
Anyone who loves me will be true to my word. My Father will love him. We will come to him and make our dwelling place with him. I consecrate myself for their sakes now, that they may be consecrated in truth, that they all may be one, as you, Father, are in me and I in you. I pray that they may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. I have given them the glory you gave me, that they may be one as we are one, I living in them, you living in me, that their unity may be made complete. Father, all those you gave me I would have in my company, where I am to see this glory of mine, which is your gift to me, because of the love you bore me before the world began. I myself am the bread of life. No one who comes to me shall ever be hungry. No one who believes in me shall ever thirst. After these and other words of the archpriestly prayer and with holy fervor, our Savior took bread into his holy and venerable hands, and having lifted his eyes to heaven, to you, his almighty Father, giving thanks to you, he blessed it, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat it, for this is my body, which is given for you. In like manner after supper, taking this excellent chalice into his holy and venerable hands, again he gave thanks to you, blessed it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it, for this is the cup of my blood, the blood of the new and everlasting covenant, which will be shed for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you do this, do it in remembrance of me. Wherefore, mindful Lord, we your servants and your faithful people, in remembrance of this Christ, your Son and our Lord, as well as his blessed passion, resurrection, and his glorious ascension, we receive from your own gifts and presence a pure offering, a holy offering, an immaculate offering, the holy bread of eternal life, and the chalice of everlasting salvation. These gifts we receive with a joyful countenance, as from him, who is the giver of all temporal and eternal good gifts, with an unshakable faith that they will become for our souls a saving remedy. We humbly ask you, Almighty God, to command that our offering be brought by the hands of your holy angel to your highest altar into the presence of your divine majesty. That we who receive the most sacred body and blood of your Son from this altar may be filled with every blessing and grace through Christ our Lord. Amen. Lord, remember your servants who have gone before us with the sign of faith and who have passed on to eternity. To these souls, Lord, and to all who rest in Christ, grant everlasting life, and to those who are in life straight from the path of righteousness, unmindful of your fatherly love, mercifully shorten their suffering. We ask this in the name of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And grant us, your sinful servants, who hope in the greatness of your mercy, some part in fellowship with your holy apostles and martyrs and all your saints, who shed their blood for your name. Their hearts are always open to justice and mercy, and with lives patterned after the divine master, merited eternal joy. Number us in their company, Lord, not weighing our merits, but pardoning our offenses, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. By whom you always create, sanctify, revive, bless, and freely give us all these good things. Through him, and with him, and in him, all honor and glory are yours, Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit. Forever and ever. Let us pray, instructed by our Savior's teaching and following divine example, we say with confidence.
blessed apostles Peter and Paul, is also Andrew and all the saints, grant us peace in our day, supported by the help of your mercy, that we always be free from sin and secure from all disturbance. Through the same Jesus Christ, your Son and our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, Forever and ever. Amen. May the peace of the Lord be with you always. Also with you. May the union of divinity and humanity in Jesus Christ bring us sanctification and eternal life. Amen. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Grant us peace. Lord Jesus Christ, you said to your apostles, I leave you peace, my peace I give you. Do not look at our sins, but on the faith of your church, and grant us the peace and unity of your kingdom. You live and reign forever and ever. Amen. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of the living God, who by the will of the Father and the work of the Holy Spirit, your death brought life to the world. By your holy body and blood, free me from all my sins and from every evil. Keep me faithful to your teaching, and never let me be parted from you, who lives and reigns forever and ever. Amen. May the partaking of your body and blood, Lord Jesus, not be caused by judgment. Though I am unworthy to receive this great sacrament, through your loving kindness may become my safeguard and healing remedy. My saving master, awaken in me a living faith, fervent love, worship, adoration, and a holy longing. Through this communion, make me your willing servant, zealous to fulfill your holy will. May it at last unite me entirely with you, my Lord and my God. Grant this who lives, reigns with God the Father, in unity with the Holy Spirit, forever and ever. Amen. I will take the bread of heaven, and I will call upon the name of the Lord. Lord, I am not worthy to receive you, but only say the word, and I shall be healed. May the body of our Lord Jesus Christ bring me to everlasting life. Amen. Shall I return unto the Lord for all the graces that he has rendered unto me? I will take the chalice of salvation, and I will call upon the name of the Lord. With high praise will I call upon the Lord, and I shall be saved from all my enemies. May the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ bring me to life everlasting. Amen. Behold the Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world. Lord, I am not worthy to receive you, but only say the word, and I shall be here. Body and the 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 body and the
You are the creator of all that exists and the originator of all that is good. You loved us in Christ even before the world was formed, granted through your holy word and this holy Eucharist that our whole lives may be only a return unto you from our first beginning through baptism in your holy name to our final goal of life everlasting with you. We ask this for our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. sacrifice which I, though unworthy, have offered the sight of your majesty be acceptable to you. Through your mercy may be effective for myself and all of those for whom I have offered it, through Christ our Lord. Amen. May the almighty and merciful God bless you. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.